Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Today marks another milestone in Britain's Brexit journey. MPs have started debating a bill that will repeal the 1972 Act of Parliament that took Britain into the European Union. The bill will also convert all EU legislation into UK law. Finally, and this is controversial, it includes new powers for ministers to alter laws without full parliamentary scrutiny. Labour has already said it will not support the bill. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, reports from Westminster. From Brussels to Westminster, laws have landed here from the continent for 44 years. Today's government bill will use 66 pages to try to transfer it all. With 28 clauses, the withdrawal bill cuts and pastes the European rulebook onto ours. But if the government riles just six rebels, they'd face defeat. Ministers say it's nothing to worry about, just a paper exercise. Their opponents fear on these harmless looking pages, there's a power grab on a huge scale. European Union withdrawal bill, second reading. Put simply, this bill is an essential step. Whilst it does not take us out of the European Union, that's a matter for the Article 50 process, it does ensure that on the day we leave, businesses know where they stand. Workers' rights are upheld and consumers remain protected. This bill is vital to ensuring that as we leave, we do so in an orderly manner. But there's so much to sort out that affects all our lives. The government says there's not time for MPs to pick over every detail, so ministers will be able to make tweaks here and there. That gives them the same powers as medieval monarchs, Labour says. And the combined effect of the provisions of this bill would reduce MPs to spectators as poor power pours into the hands of ministers and the executive. It's an unprecedented power grab. Rule by decree is not a misdescription. It's an affront to Parliament and to accountability. There will be arguments aplenty in the Commons and then in the Lords down there. Ministers privately concede they will have to give some ground. But they also know it's far from the only scrap they face, either home or abroad. If talks about the overall Brexit deal are going well, the official negotiator in Brussels did a good job of hiding it this morning, complaining about the British unwillingness to talk about the cash. I've been very disappointed in the British position, he said. There's a problem of confidence, accusing the UK of backtracking. Closer to home, a letter doing the rounds among Tory MPs has been leaked to the BBC. Dozens of Brexit supporters demanding the Prime Minister sticks to a crisp exit, not a longer, softer transition. Warning ministers, they mustn't allow the country to be kept in the EU by stealth. And was circulated, if not signed, by a junior member of the government. The letter states very explicitly that uh, we are in favour of leaving the single market, that we are in favour of leaving the customs union, that we want to take back control of our laws, that we want a strictly time-limited transition period, that we want to be able to strike free trade agreements with the rest of the world. Um, all of that is uh, uh, consistent with government policies. Remain or Tory MPs don't buy that, fearing Conservative divisions could burst again in the Tory party, in Parliament and in the power struggle with the EU. No Brexit! Not much chance no of Brexit. keeping the peace. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. Well, while MPs have been debating here, the EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, as we heard, has been speaking in Brussels. Our correspondent, Damien Grammaticus, was listening to him. Uh, as I say, Damien, Barnier was speaking, but we've also heard about some pretty personal remarks being made about David Davis. Yes, you're right, George. This is uh, internal minutes, official documents from the EU published today of official conversations between Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator, and Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the commission. This is back in July after the opening round of negotiations when they're discussing David Davis. The two of them, uh, both of them questioning David Davis's approach to the talks, particularly uh, the idea that he would come for an opening session, return to London, let the negotiators 
Barnier's get on with things, come back for a closing session at the end of the week. Mr Barnier concerned he needed someone high level and political to solve political questions with. Today they declined to, uh, to elaborate on that, they simply said they had no problems. What Mr Barnier did say was he had big issues with was the substance at the minute. So on Ireland, the questions about the border, he said the UK had to put forward proposals for how to sort that out. The onus is on the UK and on the money you heard about. He said there absolutely was a legal basis for every euro the EU is asking for, that David Cameron had approved the EU budgets, the UK Parliament had approved the spending, and that all of that, he said, had to be honoured because he said the current UK approach to question the legality was extremely negative for the outcome of these talks. Back to you. Damien Grammatica is in Brussels. Thank you very much. We're moving on now, and here, the Brexit Secretary, David Davis, claimed the British people would not forgive Labour if it blocked the Great Repeal Bill. Labour, though, said the legislation was just a power grab by the government. There was criticism, too, from the EU's chief negotiator, who accused ministers of backtracking on their commitments. Here's our political correspondent, Emily Morgan, on the Brexit backlash. Henry VIII visited Westminster today. No, we haven't gone back in time. It was protesters marching on Parliament, angry at a bill they say takes the UK back to the days of Tudor rule. The EU withdrawal bill was being debated and the government urged everyone to back it. I have in the past witnessed the Labour Party on European business take the most cynical, unprincipled approach to uh, legislation that I've ever seen. They are now attempting to do the same today and the British people will not forgive them if the end of their process is to delay or destroy the process by which we leave the European Union. The bill paves the way for thousands of pieces of EU legislation to be transferred onto our statute book. But Labour fear laws could be changed and waved through the Commons without so much as a buy your leave. And the combined effect of the provisions of this bill would reduce MPs to spectators as poor power pours into the hands of ministers and the executive. It's an unprecedented power grab. Rule by decree is not a misdescription. It's an affront to Parliament and to accountability. There is no real rebellion mounting in the Conservative Party yet, despite some raising similar concerns. If the government isn't going to move in the next two days of debate, well, I think we may have to force it to go back to the drawing board. This debate, of course, is only part of the mammoth task of untangling the UK from the EU. Away from here in Brussels this morning, the top negotiator was setting out his own priorities and he challenged Britain to come up with the goods. The EU set out five of its own papers covering everything from food copyrights to customs rules. Perhaps most significant is the one on the issue of Ireland. It states a separate Brexit deal is needed for Northern Ireland and says it's up to the UK to find a solution that avoids a hard border with the Republic. Michel Barnier then laid into Britain's stance on the divorce bill. De la position britannique. He was, he said, very disappointed by the UK's position and accused the Brexit team of backtracking on a promise to honour its commitments. There is no doubt the government's having to fight battles on all fronts. From Brussels to Parliament, the complexities of Brexit are being laid bare. These are high stakes, not just for the Prime Minister, but for the future of our country. Emily Morgan, ITV News in Westminster. Now, the government has been accused of asking for the powers of a Tudor monarch in the bill which will formally take Britain out of the EU. The debate on the European Union withdrawal bill started this afternoon. Labour and some Tory rebels say it gives ministers too much scope to make new laws without the full process of parliamentary debate. The Brexit secretary insisted, though, that the powers were fairly standard and a smooth and orderly Brexit would be impossible without them. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is at Westminster. Gary. Well, you can probably see the uh, first day of that withdrawal bill process through Parliament attracted some small, low-key demonstrations. Uh, maybe able to see one over my shoulder around Westminster. First indications from inside the House of Commons. It's going to be tricky. We know it's also going to be uh, tricky in the House of Lords, even if the government does uh, get through the main first vote, the second reading vote, on Monday. Interesting as well in Westminster today, we've got the first indications that after a fairly quietish summer, the most ardent supporters of Brexit are having a bit of a fight back. They're not happy with the direction of travel. They think the government is moving in. The shape of the transition deal that is emerging, they suspect uh, Philip Hammond and others nudging the Prime Minister in a direction they don't particularly like there. Michel Barnier, the EU 
negotiator, uh, incidentally, today in Brussels saying actually he's getting impatient to find out what that transitional arrangement is. But the main focus, as I say here, the first day of the two-day debate on the withdrawal bill. Into the swirl of documents and brickbats, today a face from history with a heavy reputation barged into the Brexit debate. True Henry VIII. The, 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 the Henry VIII clause. That's Henry VIII powers. Powers to make a Tudor monarch proud. The government says it needs powers that take their name from Henry VIII to help it deal with the mountains of EU law being pasted into British law on the day the UK leaves the European Union. Harry, one more hair, please. Opponents say that undermines the whole principle of bringing power back to Parliament after Brexit. The cumulative laws and regulations that have been passed by the EU to be obeyed by all members run into the tens of thousands. So if you're a country that's leaving, that's pasting all that law into British law in order to avoid a black hole, you need to have an effective way, the government says, of being able to change it. That means in some areas like immigration policy, there will be a normal conventional bill going through all the processes of Parliament to devise post-Brexit policy. The government says with so much law, where it needs adapting or changing just to tidy things up, they need to have a free hand to be able to do that without going through normal parliamentary procedures. A lot of MPs just won't take that on trust. It doesn't matter when ministers opposite, Prime Minister, the Secretary of State say, oh, trust us, we won't use these regulations because they could be here today and gone tomorrow and the Honourable Member for the 18th century from Somerset could be Prime Minister. We could be in his hands totally with all of these powers. And there's no point the Secretary of State or the Prime Minister saying, well, we wouldn't use these powers, take our assurance. If you wouldn't use them, they're unnecessary. And if they're unnecessary, they shouldn't be put before this House for approval today. To delay or oppose the bill will be reckless in the extreme. Mr Speaker, I have, I have in the past witnessed the Labour Party on European business take the most cynical, unprincipled approach to uh, legislation that I have ever seen. They are now attempting to do the same today, and the British people will not forgive them if the end of their process is to delay or destroy the process by which we leave the European Union. What we're seeing here is it's spiking uh, well above 20, up to 60, 69, and uh, this just points to the real low quality, I suppose, of London's air. Environmental groups are amongst many campaigners alarmed that powers they feel European law gave them ability to take the government to court for missing clean air or clean water targets could disappear with this bill. It's all well and good these laws coming on, over onto our books, but without an equivalent independent mechanism to allow us to continue to hold the government to account, there's a real worry that the laws will be on the books, but they'll just simply be ignoring them. If the government isn't going to move in the next two days of debate, well, I think we may have to force it to go back to the drawing board and try again. Even as MPs debated the bill, word emerged of a round-robin letter signed by pro-Brexit Tory MPs, urging the government to ensure that no one seeks to use a transition period as a means of keeping the UK in the EU by stealth. It goes on, we must be free to negotiate and sign trade deals during the transition period. It was a thinly veiled attack on senior cabinet ministers and we're there trying to take policy. There's a widespread expectation amongst MPs that in the end the government will have to concede backbenchers some kind of oversight of which bits of European law can be changed by fast-track procedures. But the touted letter from Tory MPs who seem unhappy with the drift of government policy on a transition agreement, a reminder that's just one major headache this autumn. Gary Gibbon, Channel 4 News, Westminster. Well, earlier I spoke to the Conservative MP and junior government aide Suela Fernandez, who leads the European Research Group of Tory MPs and has circulated that letter Gary was just talking about, warning Theresa May against any transitional deal which would keep Britain in the single market. I began by asking her, what was the idea behind this letter? It was a letter expressing um, support for the government's position to leave the single market, to leave the customs union, to make a success of Brexit and honour the result of the referendum. And importantly, 
to highlight the inconsistency and the betrayal of the Labour Party when they make it clear that they want to remain part of the single market, which really doesn't do justice to Brexit. The government have made it clear, Downing Street have made it clear, that what's in the letter is not government policy. The letter is supportive of government policy because we are saying that uh, it wants to, we, we support leaving the single market because when you're on part of the single market, Yeah, but market, you've gone beyond government means... policy is the point. I mean, you may support some bits of government policy, but you've gone way beyond the government's position. And that is clearly seeking to bind its hands. That's not helpful. That's really quite problematic for Theresa May. I'm not quite sure what you're referring to because the letter clearly states that we want to leave the single market, leave the control of the European Court of Justice uh, and ensure that we have control over free movement of people. Well, it maybe you should talk to Downing Street because they're to... the ones who say you've gone beyond government policy. The letter is that Conservative members support Brexit and the government. That's what the letter's about. So do you agree with Philip Hammond? when it comes to Brexit, the Chancellor? Absolutely. Philip Hammond has um, repeatedly stated for everybody that leaving the EU means leaving the customs union, it means leaving the single market. Uh, and I support him in his engagement with business and his need and his, uh, the importance that he places on providing certainty for businesses, on providing predictability, on providing them with a time to adapt and make changes and I'm all in favour of that because this is about Brexit which is prosperity led. If you don't get a deal then, then what happens? We, we do go over a cliff edge don't we? Because we just if, leave. If we don't get a deal. And we don't have any kind of deal. Well again as the government has made clear on numerous occasions and something I wholeheartedly support that if the EU is not going to be reasonable with Britain in this negotiation and there is a bad deal as an option, then no deal is for sure better than a bad deal. Could, could you also just explain to us what, what is the European Research Group? Because a lot of people are saying it's effectively a party within a party. It's a group of hardline Brexiteers, some of whom are government ministers, uh, operating within the Conservative Party and taking public money because a lot of you use public money as MPs to fund this group, the ERG. The European Research Group has been in existence for many, many years actually and um, its express mission is to support the government to deliver a, uh, a Brexit which is reflective of the uh, result of the referendum and which is uh, prosperity led and successful. You take and public money? It is funded by uh, public money and it has been for, for many years, yeah. How many government ministers are in it? I'm not going to say how many government ministers are in it because it is, uh, it is essentially a group of um, members It's of a Parliament secret society, who... is it? <laughs> it's not a secret society, it's a European so why, research why group. So why won't you say uh, how many ministers are in it? It's a group of MPs who have supported, uh, who are supporting the government to deliver uh, a Brexit which works for everybody, representing all hmm. strands So why of, can't um, you tell us who's in it? It's, it's, if uh, we pay for it, we ought to know who's in it. It's a group of MPs which is uh, committed to delivering the government's agenda yeah, but who? and supporting the government. Sorry, you just said you, you take public money, therefore the public ought to know where its money is going. Who are the members? It's, it's all on the public record uh, and people are, uh, are able to uh, disclose their name. Uh, I've told you... I'm where can we see the list? ...that the, the members of the European Research Group are um, a group of MPs who support the government's mm. agenda in delivering... Uh, but where can we see the list of members? Um, the, the list of members is uh, kept by the European Research Group. So where can we see it, the people who pay for it? The, it's available if, if necessary. It, well, I, I'm asking you, therefore it's necessary. Where can I see this list? It's available because uh, everyone has okay, to well, declare... OK, well, can I have it? That, uh, this is not something for... But I can definitely provide that. It's a, it's a list of MPs who uh, make clear their declarations of contributions to the European Research Group. It funds a, a researcher who is uh, providing research um, on, a, on a parliamentary basis for uh, matters to do with the European Union. So, Anna, thank you very much indeed. OK. Well, now, how many in the business community say they are increasingly concerned about how the Brexit talks are progressing? The boss of Britain's largest car maker, Jaguar Land Rover, has told this programme it would be a disaster if there was no transitional arrangement in place. Ralph Spate said today, setting out his plans to make his entire fleet of cars available within electric engines from 2020. But 
It was his warning about what would happen after Britain leaves the EU in 18 months that will most concern ministers. He was speaking to our business editor, Siobhan Kennedy. She joins me now. Siobhan. Well, John, if you want to get a sense to how much this all matters to a company like Jaguar Land Rover, the chief executive, Ralph Spate, told me today that not getting a transition deal would cost his company £1 billion if additional uh, duties were imposed on the import and exports of his cars. Now, if you consider that last year they made £1.6 billion in profits, you can see how much of a dent that would be. Now, let's not forget, this company exports about 80% of what it manufactures its cars, mostly to Europe. And about 40% of the components it needs to make its cars, it imports mostly from Europe. So you can understand that getting a tariff-free trade deal will be critical to a company like theirs. That's exactly the message he wanted to hammer home today when I caught up with him. Let's hear what he had to say. We need free and for trade. We buy parts, we buy components in continental Europe and we ship the finished goods back. And I trust that government is going to find the right solution for the export industry. How worried are you then about the leaks we've seen, about a clampdown on immigration from the EU? I guess it's on both ends. We need quantity and quality. And if Brexit is organised well, then I'm absolutely sure that we can also get access to skilled people. I read once that you had said that your business stands to lose a billion pounds by 2020 if we exit the EU. Is that still the case? No, I not only believe that, you can calculate that. Because at the end of the day, if you take WTO as a kind of basis for Brexit, where you have taxes for income in parts, but even higher taxes to deliver the finished products, and it's quite clear. Everybody can calculate it. It's an easy calculation scheme. But that's a massive hit to a company even as big as yours. That's not only a massive hit, that would be really a critical hit. You must be worried about the progress of talks here. If we get a hard Brexit uh, solution, that will be really a disaster for the society. I believe that we need a transition period. Uh, to give the politicians more time to cope with the details. What happens if we don't get that transition period? This just cannot come, because that would stop quite clearly the export industry. That would hit the society. That would also cost a lot of jobs. So there's, there's a lot at stake, is what you're saying? Exactly. There's a lot of stake. And uh, I'm absolutely sure that the politicians know what they do, and they know the implication out of it. You hope? I absolutely hope. Now, the government, John, would say it's committed to getting both a transition deal and a tariff-free trade deal when we leave Europe in 2019. And proponents of Brexit would say there's simply no economic logic to the UK and Europe um, imposing tariffs on each other in the car industry. Simply, it would be a bad deal for both. But that's the problem business faces. It keeps hearing, everything's going to be OK, just wait and everything will be fine. Privately, though, many of them are now saying they simply do not believe there is enough time to go through all these complex arrangements prior to 2019. That is why many of them are now saying that a transition deal isn't just preferable, John, it is essential. Siobhan Kennedy. David Davis, the UK's Brexit negotiator, has been taking a different kind of battering today. As the second reading of the EU withdrawal bill began in Westminster, it emerged that Jean-Claude Juncker, president of the European Parliament, had questioned both his stability and his accountability at a meeting of 28 EU commissioners. For good measure, Mr Juncker today added that he believed the Brexit talks were now at risk of failure. Mr Davis's counterpart, Michel Bernier, also expressed his frustration today, warning he thinks the talks over the UK's exit bill are going backwards and branding Britain's proposals on the Irish border as unacceptable. Some believe such language from Europe's top two is more than boisterous positioning and a sign that Brussels is genuinely losing patience, voting badly, you might think, for future negotiations. Here's our political editor, Nick Watt. The seasons, they are a-changing, and changing at a faster pace than our politics. As autumn descends on us, the first deadline in the Brexit talks hoves into view at the end of next month and Brussels is beginning to lose patience. 
I've been very disappointed uh, by the UK position as expressed uh, last week because it seems to be uh, backtracking on uh, the original commitment of uh, the UK uh, to uh, honour its um, international uh, commitments, um, including uh, uh, the commitments, uh, commitments post uh, Brexit. His boss is none too happy either, as these minutes from a meeting in July make clear. Mr Juncker expressed his concern about the question of the stability and accountability of the UK negotiator and his apparent lack of involvement, which risked jeopardising the success of the negotiations. Those barbed remarks were met with short shrift in London. It sounds to me like a kind of barroom annoyance, really. I don't know, a few drinks and away you go and you get a bit annoyed. It's kind of a, it's a front through the whole thing. Over here at the Brexit department, they're brushing off the fusillades from Brussels. One senior figure told me that David Davis would only be worried if he were being portrayed as a pussycat. Across the channel, Michel Barnier is in a different mood. He is so frustrated with the Brexit secretary that the EU's chief negotiator is prepared to put a question mark over the entire talks by ruling next month that insufficient progress has been made. Some people in Britain believe still we can negotiate everything at the same time together and make a conclusion until March 2019. But in the negotiations about a free trade agreement, which is all these technical details which we have to settle to, if it should be a very good constructive relationship in the future, needs much more time, as we know, in other trade negotiations. So what exactly is David Davis's game? Remember this? I've just presented my resignation from Parliament to the Treasury. Uh, that will trigger a process which will lead to a by-election in Halton Price and Howden. The Brexit Secretary has always been something of a subversive figure who's made a career out of challenging authority. And that is exactly what he's doing now. David Davis believes he is successfully undermining the central tenet of Michel Barnier's negotiating strategy, which is the UK cannot discuss its future trading relationship with the EU until it's cleared up the terms of its departure. David uh, has managed to drop back into the ring, play them at their own game, which is, but you keep asking about Ireland and the borders and the trade arrangements. We can't settle any of that till we settle the trade arrangements. So we can't discuss it anymore. Let's get to the trade arrangements and then we know what we can do about the border at Northern Ireland. And that final bit in the last week has been the big expose to the nonsense of this. We can settle this, that and the other. All of a sudden, the original statement, which is nothing is settled till everything is settled, is becoming completely apparent. And then there is the question of Germany's role after its forthcoming election. David Davis dismisses Michel Barnier's October deadline for an assessment of the talks on the grounds that just one date matters, the formation of the new German government, probably towards the end of this year. When she's got her domestics in order, she re-enters the ring, and it is down to Mutti uh, to actually then lead the process. Now, she'll say, oh, I'm not leading this, and I'll, she'll officially be behind the scenes, but we all know that what Germany wants here, Germany will get in the European Union context, I think that is a great dream in, in London. Uh, Angela Merkel, I know it very well, is very much for this strategy. She was one of the pe uh, forces behind this strategy. She will stay Chancellor and she will, in this question, not change her policy after the German elections. When autumn turns to winter, Britain hopes for a change of heart. But the current message from Berlin is unyielding. Angela Merkel will never compromise on the fundamental rules of the EU. And our political editor is with me now, but I should, of course, just say that Jean-Claude Juncker is, of course, president of the Commission. Now, the Brexit secretary was in the Commons today for day one of the debate. He'd been taking a lot of flack 
effort in Brussels, but he'd also been taking a little bit of flack on the right. That's right, pressure from Brussels we saw in the film, but also from Eurosceptic Conservative MPs who began circulating a letter saying that the transitional period, this is the period immediately after we leave the EU, should not be used to create a soft Brexit. And the reason why this is interesting is it, as it comes as there's a debate in the Cabinet about how to go about that transition. Uh, David Davis said in the Commons today um, that that should be close to EU membership, but the details and the timing of that transition have not been worked out in Cabinet, and there are Remain Cabinet Minister allies who fear that the Prime Minister is listening very carefully to those Eurosceptic MPs who want that transition not to look like EU membership, but to be as as far away from EU membership as possible, but I spoke to a Remain member of the Cabinet who said the Prime Minister has agreed to their phrasing, there should be no cliff-edge Brexit, which means when we leave, we barely notice. We notice it when we come out of the transition. And this was part of the foment in the, in the Commons today? Yes, uh, well, because obviously David Davis did his big legislative bit, but before that he took questions, and it was whilst he was taking questions that uh, he said all of that. And, of course, there's not necessarily just trouble from the right. There's trouble on the left as well. Well, we had a big moment from Keir Starmer, the Shadow Brexit Secretary, a few weeks ago, who basically said in the transition period, the UK should be in a customs union and within the single market. And then in an interview in the FT today, he talked about how that relationship with a customs union could continue after the transition period. Now, interestingly silence from Jeremy Corbyn and a number of Brexit Labour MPs are saying that they will not go along with it. And what is interesting is that Labour position is very similar to the EU view on how a transition should be, which is basically membership minus the votes. And I, as you saw there, interviewed Elmar Brock, the sort of veteran uh, CDU MEP from Germany, close to Angela Merkel, and he said to me he doesn't like the look of the government's approach to the transition, but he described the Labour approach as a good paper. Interesting to see how that goes down. Indeed. Well, indeed, Hilary Benn is a Labour MP, former Shadow Foreign Secretary and the chair of the Brexit Select Committee. He campaigned for Remain in last year's referendum. Charlie Elphick is the Conservative MP for Dover. He voted Remain but has since become a member of the European Research Group, an unofficial formation of Tories who are concerned about a soft Brexit and who are believed to be behind today's letter. Good evening to both of you. Uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie Elphick, uh, did you put your name to that letter? Well, it wasn't right for me to, to sign. I thought it was personally too prescriptive. But I thought the most important thing about it, it was not aimed at the government. It was aimed at the Labour Party, who have shifted their position dramatically since the election. They stood on a manifesto so of leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, and now they're talking about a transition period without an end at all. But the European Research Group, who are behind the letter, has suggested you for tonight's programme, and they are in favour of a hard Brexit. That is really not to do with what the Labour position is, it's to do with your concerns about people like Philip Hammond and so forth. I uh, don't accept that at all. I, what we've said and what the government has been very clear about is there may be an implementation period, it needs to be over by the time of the next general election, uh, and then we can move on as a country. It's very, very different from the Labour position, which is a transition without any end date at all. So wait a minute, so, so the position that you would uh, adhere to would be a, a defined transition period beyond which there's no customs union. Well, we've got a clear instruction from the British people to end uncontrolled immigration from, United, from, from the European Union. That means leaving the single market. And it's very clear that we want to be able to strike trade deals around the world. And our membership of the customs union is clearly not compatible right. with, with that. So let's just uh, bring Hilary Benn in here. This letter was directed at you. Well, the Conservative Party is having its own arguments and difficulties. I think the real problem the government has got, apart from the very strong criticism of the EU withdrawal bill we saw today, because they're asking Parliament to give them a legislative blank cheque, and I don't think Parliament's going to do that, is they are having to bring their Brexiteers along and make them realise a fundamental truth. It will not be possible to negotiate this all-singing, all-dancing, bespoke uh, trade and market access agreement in the what ten and a half months that we've got left and therefore we will have to have Transitional arrangements and Keir Starmer said out on but behalf nobody's suggesting of the Labour that there Party, won't be transitional arrangements There will be some traditional uh, transitional Well, there's been a there's been a long argument uh, within the Conservative Party about whether there should be and we've seen we've wasted so much time over the 
what, 15 months since the referendum result, getting to the point where what is absolutely obvious, namely yeah. there will have to be transitional arrangements, yeah. is finally being recognised. But it will but, be but a difficult it, message for some Conservatives there, to swallow. But what a lot of people say, actually, that it's Labour that is actually undermining Brexit. I mean, you just heard Nick Watt saying today about Keir Starmer's position. Absolutely not. We said very clearly in our manifesto, we accept the outcome of the referendum, we voted in favour of the Article 50 legislation, Britain will be leaving the European Union at the end of March 2019. The question now is not whether we're leaving, the question is, Kirsty, what kind of relationship we're going to have with the European Union after we've left. And tonight the uh, boss of Jaguar Land Rover said that any prospect of leaving without a transition would be a disaster and that is the view expressed by many many people in business and during that time if we're going to see minimal change after March 2019 it is going to mean staying in the customs union and the single market so, until the final deal is negotiated. So what Keir Starmer is saying is remain in a customs union within the single market? That is what he said in his article for the transition it, period. Out of the question. Well, what you're hearing is the sound of um, uh, the Labour figures who are wanting to remain in the European Union by stealth. This is Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave if you're in the Labour Party. We're saying there needs to be a defined implementation period so we get on and have a clear, a clear sense of direction that we're going to leave the European Union by the time of the next general election. So the, 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 what we've had um, over the last 48 hours is we've had sight of what the one of the one of the plans the government has for uh, immigration and what the thing about that is that Hillary Benn there's been a deafening silence from Labour on those plans which of course the government says is not one of a number of solutions and you know as you know people at the hospitality industry are up in arms being incredibly vocal Labour's not been up in arms Labour's not been vocal well look, I accept um, that one of the messages from the referendum result was that people were concerned about free movement and when we leave the European Union free movement will come to an end and we will have to agree what our immigration policy but is going to be. You, but you have, a, but you what have a conversation on this. You were, there was policy, Zilch said yesterday. Policy is going to be in future and uh, the point that my colleague Yvette Cooper, chairs the Home Affairs Select Committee, made was this. If the government wants to have a conversation about what future immigration policy is going to be like, don't have leaked drafts of papers appearing. Start the debate about how we are going to continue to get the people that we need to keep the British economy but, strong. But, and that is why we need to have a wait, reasonable wait, transition. And to describe it as Charlie you, does as an implementation period, the very basic point is on. you have to have something to implement L to have an implementation period. But and Hillary the, the risk leaked, at the moment uh, is drafts. we're not going to conclude leaked drafts the negotiations are meet and drink. in the time Leaked, leaked drafts are meat and drink to the opposition and Jeremy Corbyn has said absolutely nothing. He's been completely absent from this conversation. It's the case, isn't it, that his hero, your father, who absolutely abhorred Europe as a capitalist plot, is exactly what Jeremy Corbyn still thinks. Nobody can get over that. Well, look, there's a range of views within the country. You don't disagree with that, do you? Within the Labour Party and within the Conservative Party as well. And the referendum results showed mm -hmm. that the, the nation is split down the middle. Now, the challenge for us is we are leaving because that is the decision but that's isn't been the made. isn't the challenge for Jeremy Corbyn to have, step up to the plate? But we have to decide what kind of future immigration policy is we're going to have and what it is possible to negotiate with the European Union so we don't end up damaging our economic prospects because a lot rests on this and the problem at the moment as your report earlier demonstrated Kirsty is we are six months into the negotiation there hasn't been agreement yeah. reached yes but do you know what if there hasn't been agreement on reached, you Ireland, think on actually, money, you on think actually the Labour leader the point was that Jeremy Corbyn was absolutely nowhere in the referendum he's been absolutely nowhere in these conversations because his heart is not in it. There's the split. No, because Keir Starmer set out on behalf of the Shadow Cabinet, including Jeremy, what our policy is on what the transitional arrangement should look like. And that is where, believe you me, the government is going to have to end up whether Brexiteers like it or not. Thank you both very much indeed. I've been